All right, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I think that might have been the most scary introduction I ever got. Um, when I got the invitation to come here and do a short speech, I, I immediately thought that asking a guy from Denmark to fly into Stockholm to speak about creativity is kind of like asking a zebra to go into the jungle and talk to the lions about hunting. Um, it, it doesn't really make sense, and it can be quite painful, particularly for me. Uh, but all of those facts given, I'll do my absolutely best to entertain you for the next 20 minutes. Um, the starting point of what I'm going to talk about is actually this article for Fast Company. And I don't know if you're able, all, all of you are able to read this, but it says, advertising is on the cusp of its first creative revolution since the 1960s, but the ad industry might get left behind. Now that kind of sucks, doesn't it? I mean, we've all been waiting around 50 years for the next big creative revolution, and all of a sudden it seems the Googles, the Facebooks, and everybody else that want to be creative is going to run away with it, and we're going to be stuck doing shitty print ads. Um, every time I talk about it, everybody in the room kind of looks like this, and it's, um, it becomes a fairly depressive conversation. Um, but I think there is an interesting point, though, and that interesting point was actually summarized very, very, um, very, very nicely on the cover of Advertising Age Global Issue. So they said that one of the issues is that when clients were facing big, big problems uh, during the financial crisis, they continuously asked themselves the question, are we doomed? And when they talked to their agencies about this, when, if the answer of that question was no, the agency would just say, cool. All right. If the answer to that question became yes, the agency's answer was run some ads. And I think th what I think is quite interesting about this is, is that maybe we've started to interpret the idea of creativity a little bit too limited in terms of what it can actually accomplish. And even more interestingly, we've done this in an age, in an era, in a period of time where creativity, innovation, have never been as popular in business books and business kind of mythology as it is right now. So just looking at some of the titles that just come out, we've never seen so many blue chip companies be interested and, and really, really fascinated by the idea of driving creativity, of driving innovation. What I find interesting is that given the history of advertising agencies, it should be the perfect environment for us or for them to be leading this whole new kind of thinking, this whole new kind of relationship to, to clients, but it doesn't seem to be the case. I mean, even very blue chip um, consulting companies like McKinsey has come out and said creativity is an advertiser's best bet. Funny enough, that does not necessarily seem to include an advertising agency. Um, and it might be because in the last, well, 10, 20, 30 years, a lot of agencies have, have kind of put, have, have seen creativity being the equal of awards and can, which is also very, very important, but we had a, a tough time talking about how that translates into something that actually matters for our clients more than just putting a very nice statue in their lobby. Um, because basically, I believe, clients are basically looking for advertising that works. And if that's creative advertising, then fantastic. If it's non-creative advertising, then they might really don't give a damn. Um, because basically they're looking for business results. So I thought, let's just have a short look into how we can talk about creativity as creatives that might get some of the clients to listen. And I don't know how many of you guys know the IPA, but they've done a, a series of studies on this, and I'm not going to bore you to death with all of them. I'm just going to talk a little bit about one of them, which is called The Link Between Creativity and Effectiveness. Um, the interesting thing here is they've taken results from the Gun Report, the best creative campaigns ever produced, and linked that to some of the most effective campaigns in terms of generating business results ever produced. And if you look at that, you'll see a very, very, very clear correlation between a, a campaign that gets awarded a creative award and the ability to generate hard business metric success. And basically, I think that this slide or the next slide should be central to a creative industry that wants their clients to be more courageous, to be able to do more creative work. Even more so, creatively awarded campaigns 
are shown to be 11 times more efficient when it comes to growing market share. And talking about something like market share, then you start using some of those business metrics that actually make sense in a client's organization. This is just a background for one of the, for the work I want to share with you this evening. Um, we at Uncle Gray have done some work for a jeans label called Only, which is actually done mainly with Swedish uh, collaboration or partners. And the interesting thing about this project and the reason why I, I chose to bring it uh, tonight was the fact that this project have, have done very well in terms of you know, traditional creative awards, can Eurovis, blah, 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 but it's done incredibly well also when it comes to the more kind of boring planner, blah, blah, blah awards, where you write big documents and try to prove that it's actually effective. And I think before I say anything more, I just want to introduce you to a very short case study. It takes two minutes about the project so that everybody has a chance to, uh, to see it. For the launch of the Only Jeans 2012 collection, we wanted to create a whole new way for our teenage girl audience to interact with the brand. The result was The Liberation, an online interactive film experience. It is a fashion catalog, a movie, a game, a music video, and the world's first on-demand video retail environment. This is how it worked. The entire experience was built around a story of rebellion. Three girls roll into a sleepy town looking for trouble. As you watch the film, you can start interacting with it. With a simple click at any time, the film freezes on a preloaded high-res still and then turns into an interactive catalog. Every item of clothing has been tracked, and from here you can like, browse, pin, tweet, and buy. As you carry on watching, you are invited to interact with the action of the film, moving the story forward. You can steal a pair of jeans. And if you're lucky, the experience crosses over into a reality and the jeans are sent to your home free. You get to sneak a peek at a hot guy getting undressed in the woods. Another treat is the music. The soundtrack was made dynamic, enabling it to sing and flow seamlessly throughout the entire interactive experience. Feelings too. You can download the soundtrack Let Go by Swedish breakthrough artist Loon as you watch her perform in the final scenes of the movie. Finally, you get to help the girls hightail it out of town in their car. At the end, your personal experience is summed up in a bespoke catalogue, so you can revisit the clothes you looked at, shop, share, download music and wallpapers. We launched with a 30-second teaser and on-set bloggers. A thorough PR campaign kept us front page on fashion blogs across Europe. And within two weeks, we had over 280,000 visits and a 442% increase on interaction with Only.com. Before talking a little bit more, oh, thank you. Before talking a little bit more about uh, some of the uh, metrics and some of the numbers and some of the business results that this has achieved, and talking a little bit about some of the learnings we've, we've, we've kind of achieved uh, working with this and, and maybe that I can, can maybe share with you guys, I want to start by saying that one of the most important things we learned with this project is that in the future it's going to be incredibly hard to do these very complicated, long-lasting products, uh, sorry, campaigns or projects without having a really, really special relationship with your client. Um, and I think that it's become increasingly important to us that we want to attract, educate, attain, and retain some of the best clients around there. It doesn't have to be a big budget. It just has to be very, very good clients. And I think that's something that, you know, as an agency, not only the account department or the strategy or the creative, but it really is something as an agency you need to build into your culture. How do you attract and maybe even help educate those clients that are willing to work with you in this kind of way? Now, going back to the project, it had, um, I should start by saying it ran in, in nine markets. It has had a zero uh, uh, media, traditional media budget uh, across the nine markets. It ended up having 1.6 million unique users uh, um, attracted to the project. It had an average time spend of, of 6.06 um, minutes. You were able to buy products directly within the film, which was kind of interesting for the client to try 
a new kind of digital outlet for selling stuff. It generated 5,500 sales, which was a lot more than what I expected, and I think we're going to see even more of that in the future. But what's more interesting is actually that if you look at, a, at, a, at, a, at, a average, um, at an average sale on their website, which is optimized to generate as big a basket size as possible, the index of a sale done in the film was 164. Now, that tells me something about the mood you're in. If you're emotionally engaged and you can buy some of the stuff that's actually being shown to you, and it also begins to tell a story about the power of creativity when you talk about something as trivial as actually selling stuff. 96% um, of the items that were shown here, obviously we couldn't fit in the whole collection, were actually sold out. Fairly less than that was sold out of the whole collection in the stores, which then came back to the kind of store, uh, storage area. And it grew their Facebook presence by uh, 70,000 um, new kind of likes. Interestingly enough, something like Play to End Rate, which media agencies often record when they do trailers for films, Hollywood productions, they will normally have a Play to End Rate for that kind of trailer of around 60%. This project was around 74 70, uh, 68, 67, depending on the market, but it significantly outperformed trailers that was part of a Hollywood production for, you know, for hundreds of millions of dollars. And I don't know how many in the audience that actually knows you know, about, um, about click rates for banners, which is maybe 0 0.1 something. It, it, it's, it's so low it doesn't even matter at this point. This, um, this was somewhere between 12 and 19%, which kind of brings it in an area that becomes quite interesting also from a more transactional perspective. But perhaps the most interesting thing for us was the kind of online bus that it was able to generate. And as far as I know, we didn't pay this guy, but we might have given him something. Um, the Liberation is a short film that grabbed my attention for more than 20 minutes yesterday, which, if I had to guess, is probably about 20 minutes longer than any commercial has grabbed my attention ever. Which is, you, know, you, you kept seeing these things pop up uh, on different blogs and, and different places on the web, and it just became more and more interesting how much people wanted to engage with this kind of emotional communication. So, you know, how is this different? I, I went into our... Um, I went into our CAN archives and looked at some of, the, you know, when in the past when we won a lion for something, who would be credited? How big, big would the team be? And I'm actually missing a slide here, but I can tell you what would be on it if it was up here. Um, so if I have taken that screenshot from CAN, it would have shown you a case from a daily goods store that's called Factor, who's won numerous kind of uh, lions throughout the years. It's a client we worked for, and there'll be five people credited. A two-person creative team, a creative director, and two people from the film production agency. If you did the same thing, I see that it's missing as well. Oh, there we go. No? Interesting. Nothing on my screen. <laughs> did anybody see that? <laughs> no? Okay. All right. All right, there we go. Sorry about that. So this is the um, this was this was the last one. This is the only project that you just saw. It's around 25 people credited and 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 five six different companies, and I think that tells you a story about how we're going to look at this going forward. We're going to have to be incredibly good at collaboration. We're going to have to be very very good at using diverse talents to to build these kind of projects. And I want to end up by talking about three things that I think we learned working with this. Um, the first thing is about diversity. An agency culture, even though we pride ourselves as being very diverse and having a lot of different people in the agency, is kind of very conservative anyway. You know, you have the creative department, they've been there for years, you have an account department, some bigger agencies even have someone they call strategists. And if you're really, really, really funky, you might have a digital department. That's kind of it, it's been kind of like that for the last 50 years, slash the digital part. Um, and I think we should move, you know, you need to kind of start to realize that even though not everyone can become a great artist, a great artist can come from everywhere. So you have to look at your partners and realize that they can actually contribute very, very positively to the project that you're kind of working with them on. And it also means for a lot of people that the ideas that they originate, they'll have to let them go. They'll have to let other people build on them, and that should hopefully make them a lot better. 
rule number one. Rule number two, I immensely enjoy all the um, elderly gentlemen in our industry who has the best stories about the des best days that we unfortunately don't get to live through because they fucked it all up. But there, are, there is also a bit of conservatism in some of these people. And the next quote is from a guy, I, I have the deepest respect for his work, George Lewis, but he's probably not the most collaborative guy you'll ever find in an agency. Um, and I just, this quote just does it very nicely for me. When I look in the mirror, I realized that I work with the brightest person I know. You kind of know that if you put one of his ideas into a very diverse atmosphere and wait for people to build on that and take ownership of that, it's probably not going to end up very pretty. It's probably not going to end up very collaboratively interesting. And I think those kind of attitudes and those kind of egos are going to have a very hard time doing more complex projects. The last thing I'm going to talk about this evening is origination, because there is uh, John Hack Hegarty wrote a book that's called Hegarty and Advertising, and he has this fantastic idea about agencies that I love. Unfortunately, I think it's wrong, but it's a fantastic idea. It's very romantic. Uh, he says, walk, uh, sorry, walk around any agency, and the phrase you'll hear the most is, what is the idea? Now, isn't that nice? We all talk about what is the idea, and, oh, it's your idea, it's your idea, and who can, oh, yours are better than mine. I mean, I would say there's a lot of research that points to a very, very different kind of approach. What we use a lot of our time talking about, and especially creative directors, is who came up with the idea? Where can we credit the idea? Who gets, you know, who gets the glory? That's the important thing. And that's a very romantic feeling that goes back years and years and years. And it has absolutely nothing to do with the kind of philosophy and mindset that we need to build if we want to work with more complex and interesting projects. I want to finish this evening with one final point. And I think I'm going to... It's not going to be from me, it's going to be from uh, George Prest, who is the executive creative director of RGA in London. Um, and I think he sums up the future brilliantly. The range of solutions available to us, the ability to make stuff for people, improve lives and change the world, all in the name of brands, means that this is the most exciting time there's ever been to be in this industry. It's not simple, it requires a breath of creativity and it forces you never to stop learning. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Lars. Uh, when I listen to you, I hear, uh, I think about um, the discussion that we're also having in the industry about valuable advertising, advertising mm. that you're not saying no to, that you want to share, that you want to consume. Uh, we've had, we've seen great numbers with the Volvo trucks, Epic Split, yeah. for example, advertising like that, and. I could see in your numbers that you managed to spark a great engagement with your, with, with your customers. Mm. Um, can you talk a little bit more about what you've learned during this process on, on how to really create engagement and how to make the customers part of their sharing experience that you're so interested in? Yeah. I mean, I think the first thing you need to, I, I, I generally believe, is that we're at a point, at, we're at a point in time where the idea that we can still just produce pretty shitty stuff and make people watch it because we buy a lot of TRPs or GRPs or a lot of print space is actually coming to an end. I know that it's not going to end tomorrow, but eventually it's going to come to an end. Uh, and I think we need to, it's basically we're in the entertainment industry and we need to look at ourselves in that regard. If you talk about what we learned in this particular project, I think it's you know, mapping out that whole kind of journey, doing the whole comms planning part of this project, it's very much both a strategic and creative exercise, and you need great storytellers, great creatives to be part of that. You can't let, just let a planner do, do the kind of planning on these kind of things. You need creative mindsets to build that whole engagement plan and let people you know, get more and more into a project. Mm. What was it that engaged um, the customers? Were they, this, this is a, a female clothing brand? Yeah. So they mainly, were there both men and women watching and, engage, and, and interacting or I think if I, if I remember correctly, it's about 96% <laughs> female. Okay. Um, which was the target group, so which was that's the, fine. Which was the target group. Uh, but what did they interact the most with? What engaged them the most? Well, interestingly enough, the, the absolutely most interacted items that you could kind of work with was the clothes. And, and especially, 
is instead of just picking a large number of clothes, what it showed was that people would pick kind of favorites and then they would go more into depth with these favorites and they would share them. So you kind of you kind of use the film to find your way around this project and say, okay, this is my style, this might not be, I want those jeans. And then you would share them on Facebook and people would comment on it, say, well, the, the, you know, that would look nice, you know, should I wear them on Saturday, you know, blah, blah. Normal female conversation thing, as I imagine. Yeah, <laughs> so talking about the, the, the old, the, old the, the things that we're accustomed to, talking mm. about clothes with our friends, that was yeah. kind yeah. of basic... A basic and insight. Well, I think, I think in that regard, I still think it's a lot of the same kind of mechanics that drive the online conversations that we're used to dealing with in an offline environment. The mechanics, the, the technology has changed and the, our ability to amplify that conversation has changed dramatically. But I don't think the general human behavior has changed that much. Mm -hmm. And um, it seems when you show this, um, the campaign and you show us the team, you sort of had a vision that you wanted to create something extraordinary. You always do, but this was kind of a special project for, for the agency. Yeah. How would you describe sort of the, how did you would describe the leadership? Because it was, as you said, it was a big collaborative effort. And, yeah, and what was important to really take you to this creative level? I think the first thing to realize is that when we walked into um, North Kingdom here in Stockholm, their office, they were the Anyone digital. here from North Kingdom? So I can yeah. just tell lies and lies now. Well, <laughs> great. Now, well, I mean, it was fairly scary because we walked in with an idea that was a lot less finished than what we're used to. And we put that on the table and we said, listen, guys, you know, we, we haven't done this this way before, but we really, really want you guys to kind of develop off of this thing that we have here. So, you know, start thinking about it. Let's start have a chat about it. And they brought in some partners. They brought in some people from uh, Camp David and from Dynamo. And throughout that whole kind of experience, that collaborative thing kind of evolved. But it the was the fact that your idea wasn't perfect the, the was fact, perfect. Yeah, the fact that it wasn't finished, and the fact that we, I think we mind, we minded a little bit, but I think we weren't able to finish it because we were simply not good enough from a technological standpoint, and might not have been good enough from a story to modern storytelling standpoint. We needed specialists to help us kind of finish that. And obviously, throughout that process, sometimes you say, "Yeah, well, that you know, you're moving a, a bit too far away from what we originally thought. So let's you know, let's try to get it over here again." But basically, I think it's a very collaborative process, and and all of the partners should you know share equally in in the glory or blame if it goes the wrong mm. way. Mm. You also talked about the importance of having a brave client. Yeah. Um, and whose role is it to really onboard the client on a project like this? That's a very, very good question. <laughs> um, I think it more and more becomes a team effort. I, I, I hate to make everything sound like it has to be very collaborative, but, but the idea that you have an account person that have a very good network and they're kind of able to sell stuff to people and then they come in and then you have to sell them more stuff, it's f incredibly difficult with these kind of projects because you actually you do take that kind of risk and you're asking them to take a very big risk. I think they need to kind of trust a, a larger part of the team and not just one person. Mm. So building building trust is building trust is absolutely becoming key. even more important. Yeah, in definitely. The yeah, yeah. It was great having you, Lars, and I hope I hope you stand uh, stay around um, for the bar. And uh, I, I will I'm be sure the you only will have lots of uh, creative colleagues come up and talk. I'll more be the about only the work you're Dane doing. drinking Thank gin you. and tonics. Thank, Thank you very you. much. <laughs> can I just you can.